We were stopped at a red light. My dad had just picked me up from school a few minutes earlier, and now he starts reflexively scrolling through Facebook on his phone. I, being far too cool for Facebook, am on Snapchat, asking my friend about the Spanish homework. Suddenly, we hear a deep rumble from behind us, and we instinctively look up to see that the light has turned green and that there's a motorcycle behind us, rearing to go. As we continue on our way home, I look out the window and I start to notice a pattern. As drivers approach, approach red lights, they start to go on their phones, and when the light turns green, other drivers behind them have to honk at them. And suddenly, an idea came into my head. Why isn't there something like a rumbling light? This would essentially consist of a rumbling device, a device attached to the traffic light that rumbled whenever the light changed signal, just like the motorcycle had kind of done for us. This would alert drivers that the signal had changed and hopefully reduce incidents of road rage. And boom, there was my first patent. But more than the idea itself, I was more interested by three questions. First one was why then? Why had I come up with that idea just in that moment? There wasn't anything super special about the situation. I had just been kind of scrolling through Snapchat. So why, why then? Second one was how? Again, I had just been on Snapchat. I wasn't trying to think of how to solve this problem. So how had I come up with it? And the third one is, is this repeatable? Is it just a one-time thing? Probably, I thought. It's probably not going to ever happen again. And then it happened again. So this is my mom. Uh, she works from home a lot because I have three younger sisters, so she's always running around trying to get us to softball or soccer practice or whatever. So um, since she works from home, we overhear a lot of her calls and presentations. And so one day I'm in her office, and I notice that she's kind of struggling a little bit. And I'm, I'm like, why is she struggling? She's good at this. So I kind of peek over her shoulder, and I notice that the slides she's presenting are in Japanese. Now, my mom doesn't know, she doesn't speak, read, write Japanese, so obviously she was having a hard time. And it turns out she was actually presenting the slides to some coworkers in Japan, so the slides were in Japanese to help them understand what was going on. So then I thought, why isn't there some software, or some technology that allows you to see your own slides in one language and present it in a different language? It's pretty simple, right? And so that was pattern number two. So obviously, this wasn't just a one-time thing. It had happened twice. I'd come up with two patents. But the weird thing about them was that I hadn't been thinking of trying to solve a problem or actively trying to like come up with something new. This kind of happened. One time I'd been on Snapchat. The other one I'd just been kind of spacing out. So I was super intrigued by this. Like, How can someone come up with ideas when they're not thinking? And so I went home and I did some research. And I actually found out this there's this thing called the transient hyperfrontality hypothesis. And as some of you might be able to tell from the word derivation, transient hyperfrontality essentially refers to um, a temporary lessening of activity in your frontal lobes. Now, the frontal lobes usually um, they control orderly thinking and decision making, along with some other things. So what you're doing when you enter transient hyperfrontality or the state of mind is that you're switching from conscious decision making to subconscious thought, which happens to be much faster than conscious thought. But the most important thing about subconscious thought is that it gets rid of logic, or the logic that we encounter in our daily lives. And it turns out that logic is one of the main things that inhibit um, innovation. Because you look at something in your daily life and you say, this is how it is, this is how it has been, and this is how it's going to be in the future. Like, it's, there's no way for it to change, right? And that's your logic thinking. So somehow, in order to induce a more innovative state of mind, in order to connect some dots that you wouldn't have normally connected, Logic must be turned off. So I thought, how can I do this actively? How can I actively turn logic off in my brain so that I can enable myself to make more connections? And so I experimented on myself a little bit, and I came up with two methods or places, environments, in which uh, logic is lessened. The first one is situations of extreme pressure. So the way I would do this is that I would do my physics homework but without looking at the textbook or at my notes that I had taken in class. So the pressure from this came from me having to finish the homework in maybe like 20 minutes, because I kind of procrastinate. And um, so there was a lot of time pressure. So since I didn't really know the exact formulas or anything, I had to kind of attack these problems in any kind of way that came to my head. And I found that most of the time it worked. I was just using basic knowledge I learned in the past units and just kind of my own reasoning. 
And I was actually able to understand what I was doing, why certain formulas worked. And some of my peers who just memorized formulas from the textbook, they were having a more difficult time with that. So one way, one way I was able to make connections was through situations of extreme pressure. Another way you can do this is to have someone ask you tons of questions. You're trying to explain something to someone without having the idea fully formulated into your head. So since they're constantly asking like, why, how, how is it gonna work? You have to come up with things right on the spot. And so your brain is constantly trying to figure things out and it doesn't have time to be held back by logic or reason or how things are gonna work. The second environment I realized or method I came up with was to have unstructured time in your day. So I would do my biology reading, I would read all the chapters, and then I would go outside and go for a walk. And I found that when I returned to the material, I actually had a better understanding of how all of this kind of fit in with what I already knew. On this walk, I wasn't trying to look at things or like, I wasn't thinking about the reading, I was just walking and kind of looking around at nature and all that. So I found that by having unstructured time, you're allowing your brain to subconsciously make connections and put everything you know into some kind of cohesive picture, connecting the dots, putting pieces of the puzzle together. And so these two methods worked. I was able to come up with four other completely random patents, actually, that just were kind of, they're from aspects of my daily life. Um, for example, one of them was inspired by something I hear around the high school a lot, which is, oh, I wish I could eat this and not gain weight. So I thought, what if you have a programmable worm, right? And then you, you eat this worm or you intake it, and it lives in your digestive system. But you program it so that it only consumes the food that you want it to consume. So let's say you want, there's a cookie or something with some certain fat in it that you don't want entering your body. So the worm will eat the fat, and that way it doesn't go into your own system, and when the worm is taken out, you haven't gained that weight or you haven't gotten that fat stored in, in yourself. So they're all kind of completely random like this, just from little snippets of things that I've heard and just completely random ideas. So um, these are my sisters. I mentioned them before, did I? Um, there's Sara, Ria, and Anya. Uh, so going back to the first patent, the rumbling light. So uh, we, I come up with this idea, we're on our way to pick up my other little sisters, and as soon as they come in the car, I'm like, hey guys, I have an idea. I know how to stop drivers from honking at other drivers who are at red lights on their phones. And I was blown away because suddenly they started telling me all these different ideas that I hadn't even thought of before. Like one of my sisters, uh, Sara, she was like, oh, what if you put a camera on top of the car and then the camera can see whether the light has turned green and then it can notify the driver. And then my other sister, who's actually younger, Ria, she was like, no, 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 that's too complicated. What if the car is too far back or there's a big van or something, then the camera might not work. She said, why don't we just take the camera out? Just make it so that the traffic light sends out a signal to your phone and sends you a text. Like, oh, the light has turned green, you can go now. So we realized that probably logistically the rumbling light with like the device that made a motorcycle sound was probably easier than having traffic lights send out signals. So uh, we want that for the patent. But this whole interaction really got me thinking, like how can you expand innovation past the individual setting into a group setting? And so I came up with three key points from my experiences with my sister. The first one is to articulate the problem. So when, in, when you're in an individual setting, articulating the problem is not actually as important as you might think. Um, if you remember from my, like my first two patents, I hadn't been thinking of a problem. It just kind of solutions had come into my head to problems that I hadn't even noticed before. But in a group setting, you want everyone to work together to a common goal to maximize efficiency. So you must articulate the problem in order to do that. The second thing is to make it known that one person has a solution. So what this does it, is it turns the problem from unsolvable to solvable because somewhere, someone has figured out how to do it. But how they did it, that's what you're coming up with. So even if you don't, if nobody has figured it out, you can just say, oh, someone knows it somewhere. And the third thing is to have a time limit. Say you have a meeting for one hour or 30 minutes. That way, people don't just have infinite time to think about things and think about why they won't work. So for example, for the rumbling light, I might have given my sisters a slide like this. I would say, this is a problem. People at red lights are going on their phones, and so other people behind them have to honk at them when the light turns green. And then I would say, here's my solution. 
See, the important thing here is that I'm not giving them the solution. And since my sisters are all super competitive, just like me, they all start trying to fight each other to come up with the, the best answer or the right answer. And so suddenly there are all these ideas flowing everywhere. Everyone's coming up with new things. Everyone's working together, meshing together. All these neurons are firing. And all of this is sparked by this expanse of white slide. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the art of blank presentation. Thank you.